Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 1. Now I'm going to do something a little unusual today. I'm going to use an acrostic instead of an outline. Uh, this, uh, this message was percolating in my brain for quite some time, and I came up with the idea of the acrostic, but I didn't like it. I didn't like it because I, it just was, I like to use a passage of scripture, okay? And, and I was going to use scripture, scripture verses and passages and all that, but this one fits a lot better, I think. I'd like to give several quotations from uh, Abraham Lincoln. You may or may not know much about him. He was, uh, when he was nine years old, his mother died. And so his dad knew of a, another lady whose husband had passed away. So he goes over and uh, he gives the most romantic speech you ever heard. It's something like, uh, I need a wife, you need a husband, our children need parents. Uh, if you'll have me, I'll marry you. And she had him and married him. And uh, <laughs> she was a good, she was a good mother. I don't know what kind of wife she was. Uh, she was a good mother. She was a diligent woman, and she actually outlived President Lincoln. Uh, she died in 1869. He was killed in 1865. And Lincoln had many great things to say about her. Uh, she was uh, good. Uh, she treated him just like she, he was her own flesh and blood. But he had some special things to say for the mother that died uh, when he was young. Um, and he has some things to say about mothers as well. Uh, first quotation is, No man is poor who has a godly mother. The second one was, I remember my mother's prayers, and they have followed me. They have clung to me all my life. And then the most famous of them all, all that I am or hope to be, I owe to my angel mother. All from Abraham Lincoln. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, this morning, may we truly honor mothers. We've all... We all had one, and Lord, they did some very special things for us, and we ought to honor them. You tell us in your word, honor to whom honor, and Lord, they should be honored. They deserve it. We thank you, Lord, for what you have done in our lives, and what you were doing, and what you were going to do. Lord, What, regardless of where we came from, you love us. You want the very best for us. The very best is not always as the world would consider it to be. But Lord, you, have, you are doing something in us and through us, and you want to bless us. Blessings are not always easy. They're not always simple. Sometimes they can be very difficult. You see all of life, the present and the future and the eternal, and you work accordingly. Bless this passage of Scripture, Lord, as we look into it. May we all go home with a blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let me just say that really only one of these applies only to mothers. So you will see what we're talking about as we continue. I'm reading in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1. Now there was a certain man of Ramathium Zophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zolf, and Ephraimite, Ephrathite. And he had two wives. Now that was a mistake, but this is just the comment. This is just the history book. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the, Lord's, the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. 
And when the time was come that Elkanah offered, he gave to Peninnah his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, or, or, or a double portion. For he loved Hannah, uh, this is Hebrewism, for he preferred Hannah over Penina. It didn't mean he didn't love the other wife, but he preferred Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb, and her adversary also provoked her sore to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. Her adversary is the other wife. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Now you one might ask, well, why did she do it when they went up there? Very simple. Uh, Penina had a tent that she lived in, or a house that she lived in, in every likelihood. And Hannah had one that she lived in. So they didn't really have a lot to do with one another. Uh, but this was an opportunity because they were together, because they had traveled to be there. Then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, the typical male, stick your foot in your mouth, Why weepest thou? And why eatest thou? And why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? Well, as a matter of fact, Elkanah, no, not quite. All right. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post at the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto her, thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Our acrostic, as one might rather suspect, is the word mothers. So instead of point one, point two, point three, so all you can just write mothers. If you don't know how to spell it, don't feel, don't worry, I'll help you with that one too. All right, here we go. Mothers. The first is maternal. Maternal. This is the only one that's only for the ladies. The, uh, all of the others are for the ladies, but we can, we men can benefit from them as too. What does it mean to be maternal? Well, well first of all, you have to be a female. Now, I know, folks, we talk about cis male and cis female, and I saw, I saw one the other day, uh, happy birthing person. Give me a big, big break. It's getting crazy out there, folks. I mean, it's getting crazy. You know, you are what you were born. Now, we, we, can, we can talk about some other bends and twists of this thing of what people make themselves into or what they succumb to. By the way, folks, just because you have a proclivity toward a sexual practice or orientation does not mean you should practice it. I got news for your ladies. We men were not, are not naturally monogamous. Okay? We are not born that way. We have to make ourselves that way. We have to, you women could not even begin to imagine the amount of discipline a godly man exercises relative to his sexuality. You couldn't even begin. I, I became convinced years ago that most women would crumble very, very quickly under the same level of temptation. Now, I'm not trying to put a feather in men's cap. I know about their problems, okay? Because I is one, all right? I know what they struggle with, and I have no, I'm not excusing their misbehavior, their ungodliness, or any of that sort of thing. You ladies have your temptations. We men have our temptations. Now, we share some temptations, but we have a greater temptation in that regard than women do. Maternity. What in the world is it? It's called the maternal instinct. Now, some ladies might argue with that, but I will, I will make the case. We won't bother with it today, but if you want to talk, discuss it, I'll be happy to do, it, do that with you. Maternity. They desire to be 
mothers. Now, this is true of most women. It's especially true of most married women. But even when it's not true initially, it becomes true. Uh, we have we, we know someone who whose husband talked her into having children. She was not keen on it. But boy, when she had one, it all changed. Ruth had a, a fellow nurse that was not interested. She was married, but she was not interested in being a mother. And I, I don't forget the details, but she had a baby, and she was a mother. Like that. Like that. God has designed women to be mothers. Now, they're not all are blessed in that regard. But you know what? Men don't have a maternal instinct. Some, of, some men have a paternal instinct. It's not the same animal, folks. It, is not, it does not have the same ferocity, the same drive, the same yearning that God put in women. And it's a good thing because you guys, you ladies have to go through a lot. All right? If we go way back to the beginning where God is passing out, we can say the punishments, but they're not entirely punishments. And every one of the things that God gave except for Satan. Satan got it right between the eyes good. But for the woman, there was, there was a measure of punishment and a measure of blessing. For the husband, I mean for the man, there was a, there was a measure of punishment and a measure of blessing. We, we received God. You know, God, God is so good. He is so benevolent that even in passing out the punishments that mankind so richly deserved, he had to include in it blessings. One of the greatest blessings women have, mothers, as being a mother. I don't understand it. You say, Pastor, how can you not understand it? I just don't. I get something of it as a father, but it's not the same. And you see here the yearning that Hannah had to be a mother. We could go back and we look at, at Sarah. Abraham's wife and how she yearned. And we, there are other women in the, in the Bible the same thing. She was so maternal, she said, God, if you give me a son, I'll give him right back. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about, a little bit more about that later on. Secondly, we see that she was orthodox. She was orthodox in her theology. She sought the Lord. She didn't gripe. She didn't complain. She did do some crying. And when she, when she came to the Lord, you can. Uh, she, what does it say here? In verse 9 it says, So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. And what does she do? It says in verse 10, She was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. You know, people who do not have proper theology don't oftentimes go to the Lord in prayer. You know, we, we sang in our song, it talked about not having peace and having pain because we don't go to the Lord in prayer. Go to Him first. Mm -hmm. Go to Him first. Look to Him. Rely upon Him. He has all the resources. There is nothing that He cannot do. You need money? He's got money. How much? All of it. All of it. You know, I don't know how much money there is in the world. There's probably somebody out there who thinks they know, but nobody does. He's got it all. It's all at his disposal. Now, he's not sit, God's not sitting in heaven on a stack of $100 bills. All right? He controls the wealth of the world. I noticed in one of our songs we sang this morning that the next page over was a song written by John W. Peterson. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. The wealth in every mine. 
He owns it all. He controls it. God is the, God is the, the <coughs> source of good health. He is the source of every blessing. We speak of the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Go to Him. There's no problem so big He can't solve it. He doesn't always choose to go that way. But she went to the Lord in prayer because her she was orthodox. Mm -hmm. M-O-T. Teacher. Now we don't see her teaching, but it has to be. Let's look at chapter 2 and verse 26 where it says, And the child Samuel grew and was in favor with the Lord and with men. You read the story of the life of Samuel. Samuel, here's a man from the, 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 the tiniest age. Folks, children catch things before they learn them. There are huge opportunities in life to influence a human being, a person who will live forever. There's an old saying, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Someone's awful also said, behind every great man there's a great woman. And sometimes that great woman is not his wife. John Wesley had a horrible marriage. He married the wrong woman. He want, the one he wanted to marry, his brother, uh, his brother Charles talked him out of marrying. said, she's beneath you. I don't know. So, but he had a great mother, Susanna. One of, the, one of the most astounding women that we have records of. Obviously, there are many, many mothers that nobody knows anything about. It says also in chapter 3, in verse 19, And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. I have to believe that there was some great, there was some teaching, some diligence behind what goes on here. Over in the, in, in, just as a cross-reference, and, and uh, Paul is writing to Timothy, and he says to him in, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, excuse me, taking a while to get there, chapter 1 and verse 5, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice, I am persuaded that in thee also. Over in chapter 3, and in verse 14, it says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. That's from his mother and grandmother. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. We teach. You teach by word. You teach by example. When my daughter Anna was a freshman in college, they had a, a one, day, one evening seminar for the girls how to recognize a male loser. And Anna was, they really need to teach that for men too because I got the news for you folks. There's some women out there that are losers. They're going to be trouble for some poor guy that marries him. But anyway, she, she was offended. She said, well, I don't, need to, I don't need to learn this. My dad taught me that. <laughs> well, you know what, folks? After I heard that, I said, man, I don't remember that conversation. And you know why I don't remember it? We never had it. Hmm. But how does she learn the things that, what we, we might call throwaway lies? She learned what a good man is, and therefore, by virtue of knowing what a good one is, she can recognize a bad one. Hey, you know, uh, they teach people that have to deal with money, they don't teach them how to recognize counterfeit. They, how, they teach them how to recognize the real thing. Mm -hmm. That takes care of itself. You know, same thing with Bible doctrine. I don't need to learn every bad doctrine. I just need to learn biblical doctrine. And when, then when I do that, I recognize the phony stuff. I recognize the things that are not of God, not biblical. You teach 
through attitude. Something goes wrong. How do you handle it? Oh, man, I just stepped on my own toes. We've all blown it, haven't we? But you know, children are not fragile. They really aren't. They seem to be able to recognize the difference between blowing it today, but most of the time getting it right. Are we hypocrites? What is a hypocrite? A hypocrite's not a person that's weak and fails. A hypocrite is someone who doesn't try but wants the credit for being something they're not. We all fail. And children understand that. But you know what? You apologize. You say, I, I, I shouldn't have spoken to you like that. Hey, folks, children are people too. Now, I think in our day we've, we've exalted children too high. It's all for the children. Well, you know, I don't believe in that, the idea that, you know, children are to be heard when they're spoken to. No, they're little people. And they're different, you know. Uh, Charles Dickens had, Dickens had a really hard time portraying children. He did an awful job. Great books, but he just couldn't get the children to them. They were miniature adults. No, they're not. They're, they're different. But when you fail, you apologize. You say, you know, I was wrong. Boy, that'll go a long way. That'll suck, that'll, that will suck all the hypocrisy out of your relationship. They will understand you're, you're not perfect, but you're real. She was a teacher. She was honorable. M-O-T-H. M-O-T-H, M-O-T-H, yeah, honorable. How do, why do you say that? Well, you see, she made a promise and she kept it. Now, she made a promise in a moment of passion. She wanted a baby very badly, and she said, God, if you give me one, I'll give him back. You know something, folks? Baptists have something called baby dedication. It's really very poorly named. It's really dedicating the parents. And they bring the, the little baby up there and, and the pastor gets to hold the baby and, and uh, pray with the parents. But what, what is it really saying? It says the parents will rear the ch child. By the way, you rear children, you raise livestock. Okay? They rear the child to, that's, that's good grammar too. All right. You rear the child to serve the Lord. There are Christians' parents that when they, it was easy to say when you could rock that baby, when you could put it on your lap, when you could hold it on your shoulder, but it's hard to put it to practice when that baby grows up and goes off to the mission field. Yeah, reality. That reality has a has a way of slapping us upside the head, does it not? It's easy to, to, to make promises in, in 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 when when you're when it's it's theory, so to speak. It's another thing to do so in practice. But look, let's look at what she says. What it says here, verse eleven. It says, and she vowed a vow. She was an honorable woman and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid. And it was her, because her husband had fathered children with the other wife. So the problem was her. Okay, I don't, we, don't, we have no idea what it was, but there was an affliction that needed to be healed. Healed, will indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man child, a male child, a man. A, a boy, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. And she says, and there shall a razor come upon his head. In other words, he'll be Nazarite. Easy to make that promise. But verse 24 it says, and when she had weaned him. Now weaned here, I believe, is more than simply him, him not having to nurse and get his sustenance from his mother. I think it, be, it meant to be weaned, to be potty trained, to be uh, at a point where he could be on his own. 
not absolutely on his own. Some of some adults don't even make that. I wouldn't even want to be on my own right now. So all right, she had weaned him. She took him with her with three bullocks and one ephah of flour. These people were wealthy, and a bottle of wine and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young, and they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, "Oh, oh, my Lord." She's speaking to Eli. As thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee praying unto the Lord for this child. I pray. The Lord hath given me my petition, which I ask of him. Therefore, also I will. I have lent him to the Lord as long as he liveth. He shall be lent to the Lord, and he worshipped the Lord there. Now he probably was Eli. She kept her promise. I can tell you, folks, that was hard. There might may, there may have been some crying before me. It probably was. Here that child that she had prayed for would not be with her. He would be in Shiloh. She was enterprising and energetic. Most mothers are. I know there's some that are not. Some years ago, I was over at a, a woman's house. And, you know, I, I, my mother taught me as a child how to wash clothes, how to iron, how to do some simple sewing, how to uh, do some simple cooking. Um, I'm not really good. But, you know, I can tell the difference between old dirt and new dirt. Mm. Well, this lady's house had old dirt. And she didn't have a job. She was just lazy. But most mothers are pretty energetic. I can remember enterprising. I can remember my mother would make this back in, back way back a long time ago, because I'm old. Uh, a lot of women made their own clothes. You'd buy a pattern, and you would buy different... Uh, fabrics and there were little modifications that were built into the pattern and you could make and, and so she'd buy that make herself several dresses she'd buy one for my little sister make her several dresses and one i remember one night she night before easter she stayed up half the night making hats one for herself and one for her for my sister remember the old song about the easter bonnet and she would do sometimes, I'd say, well, i think to myself, well, why do you do this to yourself? I mean, she just nearly exhausted herself, but she was energetic. She was, she was enterprising. Now, one of the ways she was enterprising is she sought the Lord. She didn't just sit there and say, woe is me. She said, no, I'm going to see if we can solve this problem, this childishness. God opens and closes the womb. I'm going to go to the Lord. She was enterprising. She made a bold promise. Lord, you give me a son, I'll give you back. But she also was energetic because she made her son a coat. Chapter 2 and verse 19. Moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him from year to year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Folks, I have, I have a sneaky, I, I, have a, I have a suspicion that there was, a, there was a little bit of a wound there in giving up her son. And every year when she went up to Shiloh, it was opened again. It was difficult. It was very, very difficult. But she made him an outfit. And let me tell you about making an outfit in those days. <clears throat> I've been two or three times to a place in Israel called Nazareth Village. And there they show you how they do things. And one of the things is they make thread. Now, for, for you men, everything you wear is, all your clothes are made of threads. In fact, the, the beatniks, the, the forerunners of the hippies used to talk about, man, nice threads. 
Okay, nice, nice club. And they take cotton, which had obviously been picked by Ian, and they had a little thing and that they spun it. And they would spin it with their fingers like this, and they would feed in the cotton and they would make thread, and then they would wrap it, and they would make some more, and then they would wrap it, and then they would make some more, and they would wrap it. The, the, the finger, the hands of the of the old, the ancient peoples were never still. Both men and women were constantly doing something. When they sat down uh, in the evening or whatever, they would be doing. So first she'd make the thread. And then they had a loom. And she, there, were, there were threads going this way and then there was the shuttle that they would pass a, a thread through this way and then they would pull a thing like this and then they would pass it through this way and then they'd pull it and they would pass it back back and forth. Woof, wharf and woof, they called it. And they made the fabric and then she would cut it. I remember when I taught uh, history in uh, seventh grade history, 40-something uh, years ago, almost 50 years ago, they talked, they said it took 37 hours to make a shirt. What that means, folks, if, if you had a shirt, if we still did things like that, your shirt would cost a, pretty much a week's pay. She was diligent. But she was reverent. She was reverent. If we look at chapter 2, we see here a song. Hey folks, I got news for you. All the Psalms aren't in the book of Psalms. This is a song. Let's read it. We'll read it quickly because we don't want to, we want to be finishing soon. It, it, it say, well, it's a prayer. Well, we'll go back and read some of the, the Psalms. They're prayers. This is a song. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Here she, what is she doing? She's praising the Lord. She's worshiping. My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies. That's uh, Penina. Because I rejoice in thy salvation, your deliverance. The word salvation in the Old Testament is rarely spiritual salvation. It's deliverance. There is none holy, there is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee. There's no, you have no equal. Neither is there any rock like our rock. Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is God of knowledge. And by him actions are weighed. Now, folks, as you read this, you see spirituality here. This is a woman of spiritual understanding. The bows of the mighty men are broken, verse 4. And they that stumbled are girded with strength. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread. And they that have were so hungry ceased. In other words, God flips things as they are. So that the barren hath borne seven and she that hath many children is wax or grown feeble. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. God, not God is sovereign. That's what she's saying. He raises up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill. Dunghill is an old word for compost pile. To set them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he hath set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength shall no man prevail. And the, the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth. He shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his, of his anointed, or probably anointed one. She was reverent. And finally, she was sacrificial. Every good mother sacrifices. My mother grew up during the Depression. And in the Depression, the Great Depression, was kind of a, an economic PTSD. Did I get it right? I always have trouble with those initials. It was traumatic. People never got over it. I call it the, the depression mentality. They didn't throw, th throw things away. I mean, they would, they would 
you know, some of those people hang up their, their paper towels and let them dry so they can use them again. I mean, they just, they just never, well, my mother, my mother's dad had a good job until the stock market was killed. And by the way, it was not an accident. The Federal Reserve did it. And good old Roosevelt messed the economy up so bad there were actually four depressions in the Depression. And it was the war that got us out of it. It wasn't his policies. They, they made them worse. He's a great hero, not deserving it. Um, but in any case, my mother's mother, you know, back in those days, you got a chicken and it was whole. I know how to cut up a whole chicken because my dad's mother taught me one day. We did it, two chickens, and I never forgot. I know how to cut up a chicken. And you know what? When you cut up a chicken, when you have a whole chicken, you got some pretty nice things. You got uh, the breast. I'm not, I actually, I like dark meat better. Uh, my wife likes light meat better. So between the two of us, we lick the platter, platter clean. <laughs> and uh, but my mother said that her mother said that she really liked chicken back. There's not much meat on a chicken meat bag. No. Sacrificial. Sacrifice. You see, there is something in a mother's love that causes them to give what could have been theirs to their children. Now, some, some mothers don't have to sacrifice. But you know, really, rearing a child is a sacrifice. It really is. You lose sleep. You do things that you don't really want to do. You only do, you, maybe you, you may want to do them, but you want to do them because you want to do them for your children. You see, pe people, people are, are I, people just, if they don't want to do something, they don't want to do it, they don't do it, they don't understand that they should want to do things not because they want to do the particular thing, because they want to be with their child. They want to be with their husband. They want to be with their wife. Maybe they don't want, maybe they're not interested in that particular thing. One time I told uh, Ruth I was going to go to uh, a, a, an economic seminar. Um, Dave Ramsey was in Manhattan and I got a free ticket. He said, they said you can bring your wife. So she went too. But she didn't want to go for them. The, the economics. Now, she had a good time because Dave Ramsey is a great speaker, but she went for me. She went because she went cause you want to be with me. I've gone with her. You do things for your children, not because you want to do the thing, but because you want to help your child or because you want to be with mm -hmm. them or, or whatever. Right. Sacrifice. Mm -hmm. But you know, folks, she gave her son of the Lord. And God's not a miser. And God's debtor to no one. Now that doesn't mean he pays you right back. But let's look at chapter 2 and verse 20. It says, And Eli blessed Elkanah and his wife and said, The Lord give thee seed of this woman for the loan which is lent to the Lord. And they went unto their own house, and the Lord visited Hannah, though that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. And the child Samuel grew before the Lord. God is a great rewarder. Please, please don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. But God is so good, He can't help Himself. He has to be good. He is compelled by his, the, his own inner goodness to be so generous, so kind, so gracious. He scatters blessings in a perfect, in just, just in, a, in a riotous manner. He's filled with beauty. You go out into a wood, wood meadow where nobody sees it and you see flowers. You see beautiful things. The, 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 the silly question, if a tree falls and there's no one to hear it, does it make a noise? 
Well, the answer is there are places where no human eye will see that flower, but God put one there. Because God is filled with goodness and kindness and beauty, and He must reward. Hannah came in a moment of distress. God, give me a child, a man child, a boy. And if you do, I'll give him back. And God took him. God took him. But he gave her other children. God is so good. Amen. God is so good. Let us Amen. Pray. Lord, what a great role model we see in Hannah. Yes, she was maternal. You put that in her heart and her soul. You made her that. She was orthodox. When she had a need, she came to a loving, generous, gracious God and she prayed. And so on through the rest of the cross. Lord, we men can't do the maternal, but we can do all of the other things, and so we ought. Bless us now and bless the mothers very specially. And Lord, May it be that we would, as those that are close to mothers, may we bless them every day, not just on this one day, one Sunday of 52, but may we bless them every day. May we seek to live, to bring honor to them and not shame. In Jesus' name, amen.